Hello, my name is Alessandro Antonello and I'm recording this on the lands of the Ghana people in Adelaide, where I live and work. And hello from me, I'm David Harris. I'm 700 kilometres to the east of Sandro uh, on the land of the Wurundjeri in suburban Melbourne, where I live and work. Now, uh, we're here to talk briefly for the next five minutes about marine environmental history. And I'll begin with a question, Sandro, how do you think about marine environmental history in general and in relation to your own work? Thanks, David. So for me, in marine environmental history, like environmental history in general, demands that we appreciate the ocean, its human and more than human communities as historical, as products of mutual relationships between human and more than human nature, which are mediated by ecology, society and culture. My own work has been on two very large oceanic environments. First, the Southern Ocean, which is the cold ocean that surrounds Antarctica, and the world ocean at large. And I'm particularly interested in how environmental and scientific ideas about oceans interact with global geopolitics and diplomacy. Um, and this is a collection of relationships that stretches from the very bodies of marine animals in the ocean um, all the way to diplomatic negotiations and the texts of treaties. And in this, I've been really influenced by the great ocean historian, Helen Roswodowski. She reminds us that power is central, arguing, quote, writing in ocean history must involve attention to questions of how, by whom, and why knowledge about the ocean was created and used. So for example, uh, I'm really interested in the history of Antarctic krill. Uh, it is the largest wild animal species by biomass on Earth. And as such, there's been a great deal of interest in whether it can be harvested for humans. In the mid 1960s, there was even an argument that there was an excess of krill, a surplus, because we humans had um, done such an efficient job at hunting whales. The idea of a, abundance has ramification ramifications into the present. A marine environmental history approach demands that we actually historicize this claim about abundance. When we do, we come to see longer histories of imperialism and control in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. And we can question what is truly natural, if such a thing exists. Now, David, how do you think about marine environmental history in general and in relation to your own work? I've uh, also been influenced by aspects of Roswodowski's work. I really like her observation that often when <clears throat> some non-historians write about the history of oceans, it's as though the past is just a prelude uh, to the present. And uh, historians, of course, by contrast, look at the roads not taken. This is particularly the case when discussing the level of environmental awareness among some commercial fishers in colonial Victoria uh, in other aspects of my work. But my work generally is very different from yours, Sandro. Uh, physically, it's confined to the shoreline and inshore fisheries along the Victorian coast in the 19th century, less adventurous, obviously, than yours. So I'm interested in the bays and inlets, as well as the spaces like the Gippsland Lakes in eastern Victoria and taking in a larger Bass Strait world. But this regional world is linked to a global circulation of ideas too, about commercial fishing, about angling, and the use of ocean resources. Recently, I've been interested in how society and the marine environment interact with each other and shape each other. In exploring these ideas, I've been particularly influenced by the work of archeologists such as the late Alistair Bowen and his outstanding work on Chinese fishers at Port Albert. His work led me to look at the Chinese fishing community on the Gippsland Lakes. Here I found our pack a commercial fisher and market gardener. He lived and worked around the Gippsland Lakes between the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And through an examination of his life during this period, my research considers how the trade in cured fish influenced social, political and economic relationships between Europeans and Chinese in small regional maritime communities in a way that was markedly different from the experience in metropolitan areas where Chinese fish hawkers and commercial fishers faced considerable discrimination. Our pack 
was a skilled navigator through the legal, political and regulatory worlds of his adopted home, but it also revealed his capacity to garner personal support from non-Chinese uh, for the various disputes with which he became entangled. So there are our interests, Sandro, but where do you think we're going? What do you see as the future for environmental history? It's such an important question, David, because there's a great deal of work to do, especially here in Australia. There has, of course, been some wonderful marine environmental history work here, especially from the regions. And we can think of Steve Mullins's and Julia Martinez's work on pearling, um, Andrea Gaynor's work on some fisheries in Western Australia, and Jody Frawley's great work on oysters in southern Queensland. But there's more to be done. Um, uh, we can think of marine, uh, indigenous marine environmental histories, more work on culturally and commercially important species, and close attention to regional and coastal communities and their economies all around Australia. And in the face of climate change too, we need a stronger understanding of the history of the marine environment, so we know what's changing and how societies and cultures might change alongside. I think that's right, Sandro. And there's important research in front of us. Well, we hope uh, that this five minute whirlwind tour of marine environmental history has demonstrated some of those opportunities. So thank you for listening and watching and goodbye from both of us.